Welcome to the biomechanics chapter for kinesiology. Um, we actually, I do this one second, so even though it's chapter three, we do it after chapter one. But anyways, let me open up the slideshow presenter and we'll get started. All right, so biomechanics is the application of mechanical principles to human movement. Um, so again, human movement would be, you know, kinesiology is really human movement. So this is adding the physics and the mathematics that happens within our body to the environment, as well as the, the, um, forces and things that, that act upon the body as well during movements. Okay. Um, so, uh, we have linear motions or linear movement. Um, so linear motion is a motion along a line. So you rectilinear motion is straight line. You know, you think about running like a hundred yard dash or something. Curvilinear, you think more about like you're running back, run, you know, running around uh, tackles and so forth. Okay. Um, axial or angular. Um, so again, if you think about how most of the movements that happen in our body, like if you just think about any one joint, so you think flexion, extension at any joint, there's an axis around a motion that happens, right? Um, again, if you think of more mechanical principles, this would be how, you know, the, the wheels on the bus go round and round, right? So rectilinear motion. So um, the girl that's doing that's that's jumping towards the um, the bar to grab it, or if she did a, a pull up and went straight up, that'd be rectilinear. Now again, the, that's the motion of the entire body moving in that direction. Now if you break it down and look at the movements that would happen within her arms, you would have um, a lot of curvilinear curvilinear as well as angular motions all happening at once but in general the body is moving upwards right so cur curvilinear motion is showing you you know she is now dismant has now um dismounted from the the uneven bars and she's on her way down and so she's she's flying outward and downward at the same time and the angular motion would be the motion that happens as she swings around on the bar okay Again, all these motions happen within the body or they happen as a result of things we do in the body. Okay. So torque, right? So, so torque is, is the forceful movement that happens around, um, that happens around a, um, rotational movement as we showed in the last slide. Right. Um, so in these two, um, if weights being equal, Right, so if you look at the girl and the guy, if weights being equal, we would see more torque being created by the male in this picture versus the female as he's got longer moment arms because his arms are straight down while doing this movement as her arms are in a bent fashion. So she doesn't have, she doesn't have as long of a moment arm as she does that, as she does that rotation, okay? Um, so statics are constant motion. Um, so again, either you're, you're either not in motion or in a constant motion. Again, there you get into some, um, some physic, uh, you know, like advanced physics when you think of the fact that, you know, like these folks are actually in motion. They have equal forces pulling in the same, in these different directions to stay still, <laughs> um, so to speak. You know, again, if you do a, um, a wall sit and things there's you're pushing it's the walls the wall pushes back against you dynamics are motions that change okay so as he's jumping for his vertical jump kinetics um so kinetics you're looking at how the as the foot hits you know you go from from heel to to mid stance to toe off. Um, this is the impact and, and the action of the foot acting on the ground as the ground acts and reacts, so to speak, or, or as the foot hits the ground and it reacts to how the ground is, okay? Kinematics deals with concepts like position, time, and speed, okay? So again, um, when you look at 
these, they, they usually go together, right? So when you have forces and loads, um, you know, you, you're going to have kinetics and kinematics that happen simultaneously as we do most, um, you know, movements that we do in general, as well as when you, especially when you think of athletic movements. So force um, is a push or a pull, okay? And it's um, defined as um, mass times acceleration, right? That's the M and the A. Um, vector quantity, so we have direction of the force, we have the magnitude of the force, and then also the point of the application of the force, okay? So again, this is looking at um, as the calf is pulling. So again, this, um, this would be somebody doing plantar flexion at their ankle, okay? Um, and as they do that, and the force is pulled by the right and left parts of the, of the calf muscle or gastrocnemius muscle, as it shows, you see vector forces pulling at about 20 degrees in both directions, right? And about 200 Newtons each, right? So that you may have a, you may have a combined force pull of 400 Newtons, um, but each one of them is pulling at 200 Newtons. Now again, the amount of total Newtons, because this is also at different, you know, they're not pulling straight up, they may be able to, to create a, a plantar flexion of great that's going to be greater than 400 total newtons because again when you start adding the angles in there there's mechanical advantages that happen as well okay um we're not going to get too far into that yet um again this is an apollo mechanics book but um so at this you know the plantar flexion might actually uh, create enough force to overcome something like six to eight hundred newtons possibly because of the the degrees at which it's pulling as well so just to kind of keep in mind as you go further in your school um, that the the force equated in the muscle um, especially when you're looking at it changing angles and how they how it's splitting the the percentages and or the it's splitting the degrees and the percentage being pulled by each muscle if equal like that um, you know it can actually create a greater force than just adding those two numbers together okay. So again, um, same as they showed you before with the kinetics example, it shows you the force applied um, on the heel. As you land, you see the amount of force um, at mid stance and then toe off, right? And then you can also see the, um, how long it takes for that, to, for that to happen, right? So again, this happens in a matter of like, um, just a little over 0.6 seconds um, for, th for that entire motion to occur. And it shows you the force and body weight. Um, first is the amount of time it takes during, during the heel to toe off, okay? So again, velocity, um, you can look at stride length times stride rate. So again, I'm saying Bolt is moving at a much faster velocity than the distance runners over here. Um, again, much longer, much longer stride length and stride rate for him. Now, again, you may have a distance runner that has a similar stride length. Um, you know, so let's say that girl out in front, let's say that her leg, let's say she's the same height as him um, for argument's sake. Okay. Um, I doubt that she is. He's a very tall individual. Um, and she doesn't look like she's even the tallest one in the pack. Um, but let's say they're the same height. Okay. Um, let's say they have the exact same stride length. Okay. Um, as you can see, they're both in the air as they're running, but let's say that they have the same stride length. Um, you know, um, he's still going to be at a much faster velocity because, again, as a sprinter versus, you know, she might be running like a 1,500 meter or something. Um, his stride rate will be much faster. Now, again, if they had the same stride rate, but then we go with the fact, you know, say they're running the same, same distance, okay? So let's say they're both doing the 100 or something like that. So we'll say that they have um, 
the same stride rate, so they're moving their legs at the same amount or the same speed. Let's take her back to her normal height than him at his normal height. Um, he's going to have much greater stride length. So if he can do that stride length at that same rate that she does, again, much faster, right? All right, lever systems. So first class lever, so th this is how I try to, when I teach this in class, I usually draw these out, but a first class lever is gonna be like a seesaw or teeter-totter, right? So um, you've got the force, the F is force, the R is the, resist, the resistance or resistant force. So as you push down on that teeter-totter on the side with the F, it's going to lift the R if the F is greater than the R, right? If they're equal as it, you know, as it might be shown right there, you're going to see it sit um, on the fulcrum straight across, right? So the triangle is where you've got the, um, the fulcrum, right? So that's where, that's, that's where the, the movement is going to um, occur, the rotational movement at that fulcrum. Okay, so first class lever looks like a teeter-totter or a seesaw, however you grew up. Um, second class lever is going to be like if you think of a wheelbarrow, right? So you see the resistance force is in the middle. So if you think about the bucket where, the, you, know, where you load up your wheelbarrow, the fulcrum is over there in the front where the wheel would be. And then the force that you would use to lift up, so, you know, so let's say we're going up. Um, the resistance force is pushing down the the force that you're going to exert is pulling up it's going to look like a wheelbarrow right there okay now third class lever I call an idiot's wheelbarrow right so and the reason I do this I wish they would have drawn this where the fulcrum was in the same spot but they didn't do it that way they, um, so if you think about it if you put the load behind you on a wheelbarrow and you're standing in between and you had the two arm bars. Um, if you tried to pick up a load, um, so let's, let's do this. You have 100 pounds of rocks and resistance force of the wheelbarrow, right? When you use that fulcrum and everything and, and the force you exert to lift 100 pounds, you're not gonna actually have to use 100 pounds of true force um, based on mechanical advantage of the second class, all right? Now the third class, because you're now closer to the fulcrum and the resistance is further out, you're actually gonna have to lift with much greater force with the same amount of resistance. So if you have 100 pounds in there, and you're gonna be struggling to lift that with that type of wheelbarrow versus the real wheelbarrow. Okay, so I, I don't really have a better example. There's nothing in the mechanical world that we would use without having, um, again, using like, you know, like if you have like, um, machines doing something yeah you'll make a third class lever but nothing where you would use a natural manpower where you actually want to create a third class lever um it just you know again would not make any sense because you lose the mechanical advantage of this lever okay so here's a third class lever system speaking of um again bicep is not a very mechanically advantaged um, place muscle for flexion okay um, it's actually not advantageous at all. Um, and we have a lot of third class levers. You know, if you look at bicep, you look at the hamstrings, um, same thing. Um, well, as the hamstrings as they come across, as they come across the knee joint, let's put it that way. Um, so again, you've got the resistance out there. You've got the force being applied at the bicep as it pulls up. And then, um, you see the force arm and the resistance arm. The force arm is much shorter, so again, it's much shorter than the resistance arm, which creates a much, and it's also not only shorter, but again, um, and this is part of it being short, but it's very close to the axis, which makes it very um, mechanically disadvantaged if you were gonna use that as a term, okay? Again, um, when we look at leverage, Right, so here's some things that that um, can play into leverage. So, if you let's start with Figure Three. Um, so, if you look at Figure Three, um, if you notice the distance that the the weight will travel while that person is doing a tricep extension, right? Um, that doesn't really cover the entire motion that happens. Right? Um, so again. 
you know, they're, they're, you're really moving from, you know, the arc motion of the hand being in front of the thigh to the, to the hand being behind, behind the glutes. Um, but it's an actual arcing motion, not a straight linear motion. Right. Um, and again, the further you bend over, the more difficult that motion becomes, right? Um, now, if you look at the girl on the left, um, and you see people do this a lot when they're doing um, side bends, um, when they're trying to work on their obliques, is they will grab a weight on both. Well, in all honesty, if you just release one muscle, you don't really have to contract one, it allow the weight to pull down on one side and then uh, and then on the other side you can allow use that other weight to help leverage your way back to the other side um, which really decreases the type of work you're going so if you're going to do a um, if you're going to do lateral flexion for your obliques or side bends for your obliques use one weight <laughs> so if you're doing the left side you you know if you're if you're trying to work where you pull on your left side, you'll have the weight on your right side. And again, if you want more of a stretch, put that opposite arm up back behind your head or something and pull, right? Um, again, if you see the guy that's, that's doing pronation supination with that weight, um, again, it doesn't work so well when you have the same amount of weight on both sides of it. Um, again, he's got the right equipment there he just has to take the weight off of the bottom end by his pinky um and he can he can work his his um his uh his uh supination you know going from you know the going from the picture on the left to the picture on the right um you know and, and get a much better workout <laughs> All right, so mechanical advantages, I brought this up a minute ago. So um, when the force arm, um, you divide your force arm by your resistance arm, that gives you a mechanical advantage, right? So again, looking at the bicep, which is not, which really doesn't have much of a mechanical advantage, you can also see where your mechanical advantage actually will kick in in these motions, right? So again, when the force arm is, is shorter, um you'll see that you have more mechanical advantage there so again when you start a lift you have a bit more mechanical advantage than when you get to that 90 degree mark when you have that 90 degree mark um you're you're not your force arm is now lengthened but your resistance arm is very far away right which is bad and then as you get past that and you get closer to the to the end of the range of motion you see the force arm shorten again okay so um if you look at doing a full bicep curl um the initiating stage is usually not necessarily the hardest although the finishing stage is usually the easiest so if you go all the way to the far right is usually the easiest the mid stage is where it's the hardest. So when somebody tells you to hold the weight in like an isometric hold at 90 degrees, it is much more difficult than if you try to pull it closer to you or you let your arm sag a bit. Okay. Um, you're going to have a bit more mechanical advantage in those spots. Okay. All right. Again, pulleys. Um, your quadriceps have probably the best mechanical advantage in your body. And the big reason is your patella. Um, so depending on how high your patella is positioned, you have more mechanical advantage. It, it creates a pulley system, right? So you have a much greater um, mechanical advantage if you have a, a, wherever your patella is positioned as well as maybe the thickness of it and so on and so forth and, and that's what this slide is showing right here and the contribution of the patella in the uh, the amount of um, force that's allowed to be pulled so uh, patella uh, patellectomy is when somebody has to have their patella removed um, because of degeneration um, and so you see the person that has a patella as they get into the knee position. So you see the degrees of flexion um, during that. And you can see they have, they have much greater mechanical advantage um, and pulley um, abilities versus a person that has a patellectomy. 
Stress loads, all right. So uh, the Oreo cookie is a great example of how compression um, intention works, okay? So again, when you compress an Oreo cookie, the creamy middle of it, so is the, is the two, the two um, chocolate cookie pieces squeeze closer together, you'll see the, the creamy middle um, squeeze out of it, right? Because it's got, it's got a, um, that's, that's got the, the most, um, the, the most pliability of movement, right? The cookies are hard. The, the stuffing is, is soft. So it will squeeze out. If you think of your spine the same way, um, you've got the discs in between the bones. The bones are the cookies, the discs, you know, think of it as a cream as those two bones compress together, the disc will bulge out right now again when you have tension and pull you'll see the opposite occur so the cookies move further away from each other and you'll see the middle part you know say that middle that middle part will start to um, have some pull and maybe it might shrink just a little bit before it actually releases right um, you'd see the same thing in your discs right um, Torsion is like when you have a twisting motion on something, you know, so like when you, you know, a torsion would be like when you're twisting the bottle cap off of something. A shear force um, is when like you think of, uh, you know, um, cutting through, like you see some of these guys with these sharp swords that cut through like a, like a stick standing up and it, and it comes slicing through um, either straight across or an angle and then bending is like when you break a stick right you take a stick and you bend it and break it okay so um again depending on the type of strain that's going on you can see a uh, deformation or change in the shape or length of a bone based on where the strain occurs um mathematically you'll see this in change in length um divided by the original length Again, this um, somebody that had a major um, ankle twist, um, and this is an open fracture of the bone coming through. So stress strain curve, right? So we have the toe region as the stress, um, as the stress, the stress strain both climb higher. You have this elastic range. This is where this stretching occurs. Okay, um, the elastic limit will then be reached. Okay, uh, the plastic range. So when you think of um, uh, when you think of uh, like when you're trying to get more flexible. Okay, so uh, the so when we do short short uh, stretch cycles. So when we're trying to jump higher, we try to stay. We try to go from the the toe region and try to hit the elastic limit, right? And we try to use that as a bouncing mechanism to help us jump higher. So, okay. Now, if you're trying to work on your flexibility, you hold positions in the plastic range, trying to elongate muscles and tendons and ligaments to allow you to then over time create more range of motion. Okay, so that's what we call the plastic range. Necking is where you start to see the um, whatever is being stretched, so say the tendon, ligament, or muscle, um, it is the the tissue is, is starting to be pushed to its limit um, of failure, and you actually see the stress um, at this point. So the strain is still there, but you'll see the stress drop off, and then ultimate tensile strength will happen at the end of that. And once you pass that point, that is where you will have tearing that'll occur, right? So you'll tear your ligament, your tendon, or your muscle, all right? Stiffness, ratio of stress to the strain, or, um, so again, you have elasticity modulus. Um, so again, which will have um, higher, higher amount of stiffness. Um, and again, it depends on, um, you know, the way that the way that you pull right so on the tape there's a way at which you know if you grab the the uh, tape and you pull it rips really easy now if you pull it in other directions it has more elasticity um or or it'll have more stiffness in the fact that it's harder to break now bone 
um, you know, depending on which way you pull on that bone, it's going to be the same thing, right? So it has to do with the, 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 the um, cross-sectional way that the fibers go and, and the way that the bone is built, right? So that bone right there um, is, your, is your femur. Um, I think that's, yeah, I think that's, maybe it's a, or is it a humerus bone? I can't tell. It's a small picture on my computer. Um, I see the, uh, it's, it's got a head and neck on it. It's femur humerus. Um, to me, it looks like a femur because the condyle's down there. Anyways, either way. Um, so let's pretend if it's not the femur, it's the femur. All right. Uh, so if it, if you compress the femur, um, the femur is, is thick, and, and if you look from top to bottom as you compress on it, um, you know, it can deal with a lot of um, compression stress, right? If you pull on it, again, it can deal with a lot of pull strength. Now, if you hit it from the side, you can see, um, you know, the, the diameter of it is not as thick as the length of it right? So again, that's going to be where its breaking point is most vulnerable, okay? Um, so if you look at the Young's module of, of different solids, um, this shows you um, from strain to stress, right? Um, and you can see diamond is, has got the hardest, um, you know, is the hardest per square inch based on, you know, or can deal with the most PSI. Um, versus rubber at the top, all right? Um, shell membrane of an egg, human cartilage, human tendons, fresh bone. Again, you can see bone is much, much um, more solid versus tendons, cartilage, so on and so forth, right? Um, again, you know, the, this, the, what things are made of and the density and so on and so forth and, and the amount of room in between with air and all that plays into that, okay? So stress strain for bone and skin, okay? So bone is more stiff, skin is more compliant, so it has a lot more stretch to it, so it can deal with more strain, where bone can deal with more stress, all right? Um, loading rate, so again, a Twizzler. Um, I, I, I don't really like Twizzlers, but I get the idea here. Um, same thing with gum. Like if you have a piece of gum and you pull it, if you pull it slow, it stretches, right? Um, and, and you got to pull it very far before it'll actually then, you know, like actually break into two pieces, you know, same thing with the Twizzler. You, if you pull slowly, it'll stretch for a while before it breaks. Now, if you pop it really quick and just pull it, it will break right away. Right. And that's loading rate. So the loading rate, the, 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 the faster, the loading rate, the more, t the, the quicker, the time to failure where something will tear. Okay. Um, don't worry about this. It's got nothing to do with you. All right. Um, so that's the end of the of biomechanics again, kind of short and sweet. The book will go into more detail, but um, that's what we got for the notes. Um, if you have any questions, email me, write me on Blackboard, text me, and I'll help you out.